Hi, this is Simon from Tokyo Productions and welcome to another tutorial for Blackmagic Fusion. And today we're going to be looking at the new 3D camera tracker in Fusion 9. Now I've got this shot here that I used for my planar tracker tutorial recently, but I thought it'd be quite interesting to see what we can do with the 3D camera tracker on this particular shot. So this was the quick test that I came up with. I've replaced that central transport knob with this rotating trackball, and we've got this realistic lighting falling onto our background scene. So first of all, let's select the camera tracker. So shift spacebar CTRA, that's the shortcut. Now, you might be tempted to dive in and just get tracking straight away, but this is not a good idea. We want to be able to control the number of points that are created and where they're created. And without pre-preparing our footage, we're going to be tracking all sorts of things we shouldn't be tracking, such as this, this shiny area here, various edges. You can see that point there, for example, that shouldn't be there. This shiny trackball here, this knob here. So all sorts of things that we don't really want to be tracking. So to avoid having to track those and at the same time keep the track point count up, what we'll need to do is create some masks to mask out the areas that we don't want. Okay, I'm not going to show you the entirety of this process. I'm just going to show you the beginning and the end. First of all, let's click on the flow area. Let's select the polyline tool and let's mask this area up here. So that shiny screen and these knobs like that. And then we'll click on the tool again to add another one. And let's mask this area over here. Okay, I'm not going to show you, as I say, the whole process. Uh, I'll come back when it's done and explain exactly what I've done. Okay, so what I've done is I've made a whole series of masks. The first one I've set to invert, and then each of the subsequent ones I've set to subtract. And that's apart from this one here, where I wanted to add back in the, um, if we look at that, I wanted to add back in this keypad over the top of this shape that I'd already cut out. And what I've done is I very roughly keyframed those so that they match the movement of the camera. So then what I'm going to do is take the output of that combined result and pipe it into the camera tracker's track mask input. And now let's look at the camera tracker itself. In the track tab here, let's turn on preview auto track locations. And now I think you'll see that we haven't got any trackers in these problem areas. And what I can then do is I can reduce the detection threshold. I'm going to get, come down to about two. And the minimum th feature separation around 0 0.02. The defaults give me slightly too few trackers, but then again, I don't want to go too crazy and have too many. And I'm going to select red for the track channel, I think, which I think will give me a better result than Luma. Okay, so I'm going to press auto track. And what it's going to do is track forward. And because I've got bi-directional tracking turned on, once it gets to the end, it's going to track back to the beginning again. And that's just a sort of safety measure to double check all those tracks. You could turn that off if you don't want it to track in two directions. OK, we're done. We're done tracking. Let's come over to the camera tab. Nothing much I can do here because, as, as, as I've probably mentioned, I've shot this on my phone and I've no idea what the lens was and I don't know how much curvature there is. So I'm just going to Click on Refine Lens Parameters so that the solver makes an effort at trying to guess that as well as the focal length. And then I'm going to come to the Solve tab and I'm going to turn off Auto Select Seed Frames. Now, I don't want you to go into too much detail about how this works, but I would, it would point out that if you can set the seed frames manually, you'll get a much faster track than if you use the Auto Select option. So let's hit the Solve button and it'll run through and create the 3D solve. So we've got an average solve error up here of 1.1227, and that's really not too bad as a starting point. We've ended up with 330 tracks, and that's good. Not only do you not want too few tracks, you also don't want too many, and that's part of the reason for setting up those masks. 
so that we weren't unnecessarily creating tracks that we didn't need. So one thing I like to do is come over to the flow and I'm going to add a 3D transform, so 3XF, and I'm going to take the camera tracker's scene output into the 3D transform and let's view the 3D transform. And what this gives us is a view of how the solvers actually worked. So there's our camera looking at our plane there and you can tell that we've got a fairly good representation of our console with this point cloud. And what this view allows us to do is to identify trackers that are clearly incorrect. And we can actually select those like that. If we come back to our camera tracker itself, we can actually delete these because we don't actually want to use them. I'm going to delete these ones here as well. I'm not being terribly precise about this, you want to spend a bit more time thinking about this. And let's see what happens if we just now run the solve again. And we've improved our result quite nicely already. So let's come back to the flow. Let's select the camera tracker itself. Some obvious ones we can delete like these red ones here. And I think what I'll do is I'm going to delete all these trackers at the top here because they're not actually tracking accurate data at all, I don't think. So I'm going to select all of those like that and delete those. And I might just delete those four down there as well. So as you probably know, this is a very much an iterative process. It's about deleting bad tracks we obviously don't want. Now let's look at the track filtering. Until you actually move one of these sliders, you don't get any filter result. But as soon as I move it, you'll see that I've now got some bad tracks selected. Let's just delete those. Still, we are still left with 230 tracks and we can solve again. So we're down to about 0.6, and for the purposes of this, this is probably going to be good enough. You really want to get down below 0.5 if you can, but given in this instance I've shot this with my crappy old phone, this is a pretty good result. Okay, I think we can now move on to the Export tab, and let's open up the 3D Scene Transform. Now, you might be tempted to just sort of export as is, but I really recommend that you try to align your scene first, because aligning the ground plane in particular is an absolute key to getting a good result with the camera tracker. So let's click on the unaligned button there. Let's select what we know to be a fairly decent track point, that number one button there, and let's set that as the origin. Next, we want to select at least three points that define the ground plane. So I'm going to select this one here, uh, this one here, one up here, and maybe that one up there, maybe this one here as well. And I'm going to hit set from selection, and this is going to create a ground plane for the console. I'm not worried about the desk here. Um, I, I want to insert something onto the console itself, and, that, and that's tilted a little bit away from me, so I want to treat that as though it were the, the, the ground rather than the desk. So I'm going to hit Set from Selection, and then what I'm going to do is come over and select the Aligned button here. And then I'm going to select the Transform, and I just want to show you what's happened. Our camera is actually down below the floor and looking up. And we don't want that. We want it to be above looking down. Otherwise, all our geometries are going to be a bit hard to cope with. So let's come back to the camera tracker. And the problem here is the X rotation. So if I click on the unaligned button again, let's come to the front of this X rotation field. I'm going to type 180. So it's going to be 180 minus that X rotation value. And that's going to swap that around. So now if we come back to Aligned and we come to Transform, you'll see we're much better. Our camera is now looking down and our console is flat on the ground plane. And that's all looking pretty good. One other thing we could worry about is the scale, but in this instance, it's not something that needs to be addressed because the scale is going to be correct for the sort of thing that I want to do. So we're ready to hit the export button. So let's do that. And you'll probably see that's created a bunch of new nodes here. So the 
result is this node here called Camera Tracker, and it's a 3D renderer. And we've also got a point cloud, which we're currently not seeing, a ground plane, and of course the camera, which has our all important tracking information applied to it. So what I want to do is I just want to make a slight adjustment to the ground plane. You'll notice that it's not in alignment with my console. So I'm going to come to its transform here, and we just need to affect the Y rotation. That's all it is, it's nothing else. So before I do that though, I just want to come over and increase the subdivision level here so we can see a bit better. Let's increase that up to 50, and it gives us a much better idea of whether we've got this lined up or not. So let's come back to here and let's adjust the Y rotation till we get everything lined up nicely. And if we do a quick little preview of that, I think you can see that we've got a pretty decent result there. So you can see the virtue of having done our work on the ground plane and it's going to make life much much easier as we build our scene. Okay so now we're ready to add some geometry to our scene so I'm going to select 3D shape, I'm going to select sphere, let's have a look at what we're creating here. I'm going to set the end latitude to zero so we get this cup that's sitting on the floor and let's increase those subdivisions to 50 just so we get a nice smooth result. And I've got a texture here that I'm just going to bring in just so it looks a little bit nicer. I won't explain how this is all done just at this point. I also quickly want to set the radius to 0.27. Okay, and now what we can do is we can pipe that into that 3D merge there and then look at the result. Then all we need to do is take that shape, come over to its X and Z offsets and just shuffle it into position. Okay, so there we are, it's in position and it's locked pretty well to my console there. All I've done is change the X and Z because we want it sitting flat on the ground plane and that Y offset of zero is correct for our half cup. Okay, so the final thing I'd like to show you in this part of the tutorial is how to add a light so that it casts a shadow from our object onto the scene. So first of all, let me add a spotlight and I'm going to pipe it into the 3D merge. And I'm just going to very quickly adjust it so it's pointing in the right direction. And then I want to come over to my render node here and I want to set the render type to software renderer. And I'll turn on the enable lighting and enable shadows. The next step is to come over to the ground plane and come over to the blend mode here and under software blend mode, because that's what we're using, we're using the software renderer rather than the OpenGL, let's select multiply. And if I come over to the spotlight and we just adjust the spread of the light, you can see that the light is lighting my background image and casting a shadow, and it's also lighting my trackball here. However, we don't actually want the ground plane to be lit by this light. So let's come over to the materials and let's just turn off receive lighting for this ground plane. And the other thing we need to do is we need to set the color to white because don't forget this is now being multiplied and any color other than white is going to darken the scene. And the only way it will be completely transparent is if all those values are at one. And now our ground plane is invisible to the camera, but we are getting this shadow and we can adjust the softness of that shadow. And that's really not, not looking too bad. So again, this shows the importance of setting up the ground plane correctly. We're using that ground plane to accept the shadow and effectively cast it onto our background scene. So there you go. Obviously that shadow doesn't represent uh, what's really happening in this scene, but I wanted to show you the principle of how you'd apply a shadow if that's what you actually needed to do. So here again is my finished result. I won't go into details of how exactly I finished this because it's beyond the scope of this tutorial, but I might do a follow-up. I've only really shown you the basics of how you might go about compositing this. And in this tutorial, I really just wanted to give you some pointers about best practice for 3D camera tracking. So thanks very much indeed for watching, and I hope to see you again the next time.